right, good morning, counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. All right, record reflect that the defendant is present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Douglas, Mr. Bailey, people represented by Ms. Clark and Mr. Darden. The jury is not present. Mr. Douglas, you had two matters you wanted to address the court on. I would, Your Honor. I'd like to just state for the record that yesterday I turned over to the prosecution copies of two separate videotapes, which I believe completes my obligations of turning over copies of videotapes that we culled to create the montage of different crime scene contamination. And this morning, Your Honor, though I had it yesterday, I forgot to turn it over. And I also turned over yesterday a statement of Reggie McKenzie, which reflects a recent telephone interview. This morning, Your Honor, consistent with the court's orders, I turned over the statement of the Honorable Delbert Wong, and I also turned over an updated supplemental witness list, primarily including those DNA people that had been uh, inadvertently admitted from the earlier list, um, and Dr. Fishman, and Dr. Reichardt, and Howard Weitzman are included on the names on that list. All right. The second matter deals with, Your Honor, as will likely be the case each evening when I return from court, or when we return from court, we have conversations with Dean Ullman and Professor Dershowitz, and I had conversations with them both last night and again this morning. And a couple of points um, Professors Dershowitz and Ullman spoke to me about that they wanted me to stress to the court. And that deals with, Your Honor, the, the state of the current record as a result of a decision that I think, with all due respect, was made incorrectly concerning the implications of having excised a portion of Mr. Simpson's alleged statement about a polygraph. As the court understands, the statement about the dreams followed some reference to a polygraph. And under one particular scenario, Mr. Simpson is innocent. And the question is raised about taking a polygraph. And Mr. Simpson says, I'm innocent, but I'm wary about taking a polygraph because I've been having dreams about killing Ms. Nicole. Assume for the sake of my arguments that that is an accurate reflection of what occurred. The statement about, and, and that it was jokingly made, as Mr. Shipp suggested, and in fact, he also says that there was a chuckle before talking about the dreams. When the statement is taken in that context, in the context of reference to a polygraph, it says, I'm innocent, but I'm afraid to take a polygraph because I've been having these dreams, and I'm afraid that these dreams may cause there to be a false positive reading on the polygraph. And that's why I'm afraid to take a polygraph. That is an explanation that is very consistent with innocence and that would have enabled us to argue a theory that would have been consistent with Mr. Simpson's innocence. The way that the record unfolded, however, is far more sinister. And as the court will recall, there was first a question that was asked of Mr. Shipp that Mr. Simpson raised the issue of DNA. Then Mr. Darden led him and said, what was Mr. Simpson's next response? And the, the statement was, well, he said, that I've been having a lot of dreams about killing Nicole lately. Now, Your Honor, because we have had... I don't think that was precisely what he said. Well, the statement about the dreams followed the statement about the DNA. And the question was, how did he respond? Or what was the next statement that was made in response? And there was this immediate linkage of the dreams to the DNA. My concern and my problem, and Professor Dershowitz and Ullman's problem is that now a statement that we could have possibly interpreted for the jury in a manner that would have been consistent with innocence is now going to be given to the jury in a manner that makes it very sinister and very foreboding. And that just causes to exemplify, if you will, the rich prejudice that has flowed from the fact that the polygraph information has been withdrawn and from the fact that there has now been this incorrect, if you will, linkage. Uh, in essence, Your Honor, 
it is a false linkage because the statement of the, poly, of the dreams did not immediately follow the statement of the DNA. All right, let me ask the reporter. Madam reporter, when do you anticipate the uh, transcript for from yesterday, the precise language will be uh, available? All right. All right, it's being put together? Yeah. All right. I now have a quandary, Your Honor. I am not prepared to waive um, references to a polygraph or conversations about polygraph because I fear that even though Mr. Simpson, through his attorney on June the 15th, wrote a letter offering or accepting the, un the invitation for a polygraph, so long as the results were admitted into evidence, that opens up an entire can of worms that in consultation with my colleagues, we've chosen not to want to, to get into. But I have a quandary. And the typical resolution of my problem, which might be to offer a limiting instruction, creates other problems because what it serves to do is to, bear, is to merely highlight the offending relationship about which I complain. Um, I think what has occurred, however, is that an untenable situation has been created. All right, Mr. Douglas. An untenable situation has been created, and I think it should be correct, uh, corrected. I think that it should be clearly, that I should be allowed clearly to state or to ask Mr. Shipp that in truth and in fact, the statement about the dreams did not follow the statement about DNA. That when he said yesterday that it did, that was untrue. And I well, think- he didn't, No, he didn't say that it did. The, the order of questions was that, in the, gave that inference. I believe, Your Honor, it even stronger than that, and I, I would like right. to wait for the court to, to just make specific reference to the record first. All right. All right, Ms. Clark, as to that issue. As to that, that's ridiculous. The witness was ordered not to say anything about the reference to the polygraph, and now we're going to give an instruction to the jury that for following the court's orders, he's going to be called a liar? That's absurd. He was ordered to excise that portion of his statement, and that is what he did at the court's order. Well, I think what Mr. Douglas is saying is that there's an inference that one is linked with the other. I agree with your point that the instruction that it, something was not true uh, is a bit strong. It's just that the testimony may have left that inference, which is not correct, that there was something that intervened between then, those two events. Yes. Okay. All right. Which and I think I think you can either clear up on redirect or on uh, during cross, however you wish to do that. Uh, could, counsel, while you're at it, while we're talking about this particular um, subject, would you, uh, next time we have a break, read the case of people, excuse me, State versus White at uh, 271 North Carolina, 391. I'm sure your research attorneys can get it off Lexus. It's a uh, 1967 opinion from the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court. Pertaining to this? Pertaining to admissibility of statements regarding dreams and the impact, 271-391. 156 Southeast 2nd, 721. I'll have uh, uh, one of my law clerks make a photocopy. I have, a, I have the Lexus version of it. You might want to take a look at this. May I be heard, Your Honor? Certainly. Counsel uh, makes a great deal of the inference he would like the jury to draw from this statement. Um, that's fine. The jury can draw whatever inference they want to from it. It happens very often that statements and evidence are submitted to the jury from which they can draw one of two or three or more inferences. In this particular case, I think that counsel's in the inference that counsel seeks to have the jury draw is unreasonable. The actual inference that should be drawn, even if you put the polygraph statement back in, is that it's an alibi. It's an excuse for not wanting to take the polygraph in the knowledge, in the sure knowledge, that he will flunk it. And as a matter of fact, although counsel makes much of a letter that they sent, uh, what they actually indicated in the letter was that they would consider taking a polygraph if it were stipulated that the results would be deemed admissible, which they know cannot be done. However, uh, in response to that letter, a phone call was made to counsel in which the counsel was invited to bring his client in for further questioning and declined to do so. Um, so if, client, if counsel would like to at this point open that issue up, 
bring up the fact that there was an offer to take a polygraph that was actually conditional and the fact that he was offered the opportunity to bring his client in for questioning and declined to do so, that's fine. We can put it all into context and the people would not object to that. But Mr. Douglas but, has already indicated it's their position that there are too many cans of worms there. In that case, Your Honor, I think that the, the avenue that the court took was clearly the appropriate one. Uh, all that we have, have here is a statement that had some <coughs> inadmissible reference that was excised from the admissible uh, portion of the statement that is clearly an admission. Uh, I think that it's been the defense that has been compl complaining repeatedly throughout this trial that the people are seeking to relitigate and relitigate rulings and come back and argue with the court about rulings. It has been the defense repeatedly that has done well, so and is doing so again. Status of our we're conducting the 403 foundational during the course of this as well. Don't forget. Right, but that's not what counsel's argument pertains to, Your Honor. It's not a foundational issue that's being argued here. It's the admissibility that's being argued here. Um, and I think the court has already resolved that ruling, at least I thought it had, and appropriately so. The reference, the thing about this statement is, Your Honor, and, and the reason that uh, I wonder about the, the position that counsel is taking is that if counsel feels that the inference is actually a one of innocence, then, and, and can argue that to the jury, then obviously it isn't all that prejudicial because there are two inferences ca that can be drawn. Uh, the significance of dreams is not that we're saying literally, it's not even actually a hearsay issue. We're not asking for it to be accepted for the truth of the matter. It isn't that we contend that he's dreaming. It is that we contend that what he is saying is he's been thinking about killing her. And that is precisely what he's been charged with. Are so, you saying it's something on the order, I've been dreaming of becoming a major league ball player something like that. The counsel's free to argue that. That's not the inference that I think is reasonable. We think that the argument, the, the inference that is reasonable from this is more in the nature of I've been thinking about it, I've been thinking about doing this, and so I'm afraid that I'll flunk the polygraph. It's an excuse for not taking the polygraph. It's an excuse for failing the polygraph. That's the people's position. And I think that's the reasonable inference that a common sense, common thinking person would draw from this. But counsel can argue to the contrary, and that's why the prejudice is, it does not exist. Counsel's very free to argue to the jury that it's in the nature of what the court has said. Right. I dream. But in fact, you know, I think Walt Disney said it best in, I think, what was it, Sleeping Beauty? A dream is a wish your heart makes. And that's what this, that's what this defendant was talking about. You know, this is something that he thought about and something that he wanted to have happen. That's another inference that can be drawn. But, I mean, the fact that there, that there are multiple inferences that can be drawn, Your Honor, I think is what um, allays so much the prejudice that counsel is referring to. Subject to interpretation. That doesn't mean it doesn't come in, obviously. Many things come in that are subject to interpretation. The court is very well aware of that. And this is another one. But it, does the court, if the court would like, we will go and read the case that pertains to this and argue it later. All right. I'm just giving you the invitation to do that. Okay. As soon as I get the uh, text of what was actually said. I believe... I believe that what was actually said was that, and I think I recall this pretty accurately, that Mr. Shipp indicated that the defendant kind of laughed and said, I have had some dreams uh, about killing her. And I think that does mitigate. But um, if the court would like, there, there can be an indication um, through the testimony of the witness that there were intervening remarks made that one, the reference to DNA was not immediately precedent to the remark about having dreams. All right, well, let me find the text here. Okay. And we'll see. All right, Mrs. Robertson, while, you're, while we're waiting, would you make uh, two photocopies of this case for me, please? Thank you. I thought Mr. Douglas was handling this issue. Slide, he is. I have a request. What is that, sir? It has to do with that. Sure. I'm mindful of the one lawyer per side. Mr. Mr. Douglas will respond to Ms. Ms. Clark. I would like, however, uh, at the appropriate time, if we have a few minutes, to make a phone call. I need to talk to Professor Dershowitz with regard to this whole issue that she raises about the polygraph and the letter that was sent by Mr. Shapiro. And uh, I, I would yeah, need I a few minutes to be able to. And the others never responded. So they never responded to the letter. They can talk about any conversation they want to. Yeah, I need to. Counsel was not I on the case to, at the I, time. I need, Wait, doesn't wait. matter. The letter wasn't responded to, but I was on the case or not. I lived well, in Los Angeles at the time. Excuse me, Ms. Clark. I'm sorry. Your Honor. All right, thank okay. you. Both so sides. What I'm asking her is that at the appropriate time, if I can have a few minutes to call Professor Dershowitz and Professor 
Ullman. I, I can make a final decision with regard to our, our view on the polygraph. That's all I'm asking. All right. Yeah, I'm waiting for the passage. Mr. Hill, why don't you give me the transcript? Chris. Reference to page one two seven seven nine. And in fact, before I read this to you, let me uh, now everybody's disappeared. Miss Scalinas, would you come up here, please? Fortunately, I erased my computer from yesterday, since I have the hard copy. While we're waiting uh, for the photocopies, Council, um, yesterday uh, it was brought to my attention that there were certain things going on out in the audience and inside the bar uh, that were brought to my attention. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, let me remind you that any reaction, gestures made during these court sessions, especially while the jury is here, those activities are inappropriate and will result in your expulsion from the courtroom. Also, I was shown a videotape of counsel inside the bar making similar reactions, gestures, facial expressions to the testimony that are inappropriate. And I'm cautioning counsel as well, and I have that on videotape. So counsel are cautioned and staff are cautioned as well. That's a caution. One, two, seven, seven, nine, and eight, oh. Counselor, do you have the text before you, starting at um, the relevant question and answering starts at roughly line 11 on 12779? I think, Your Honor, if I may. Yes. 
that my point is reflected by, if I begin reading from line 16, and at that time, did you know the correct answer to that question? The answer, I did not know the correct answer, but what I did say, I just got, I just off the cuff say two months. And what did he say in response to your indication that it takes DNA two months to come back? He kind of jokingly just said, you know, quote, to be on a ship, that's what he called me, ship. He said, I've had some dreams of killing her. And the nature of Mr. Darden's leading question to direct the, the witness's focus away from the polygraph information improperly gave the inference that the dream sequence or the dream, the alleged great dream statement was made in direct response to the DNA statement, which is factually untrue. Even more gravely, Your Honor, I think that what... All right, but Mr. Douglas, isn't this something that you can deal with on cross-examination? Well, Your Honor, what I wanted to do in raising this was to clue the court beforehand that I intend to ask the witness that that statement, that alleged statement, was not in response to the DNA question. Uh, That's what I mean by cross-examination. I agree with you that, that that question, the way it was phrased, creates a uh, inference that is not accurate. Your Honor, there is even, one moment please. The difficulty that I have, Your Honor, that Mr. Cochran is, 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 has reminded me is, Mr. Ship is not a friendly witness. And Mr. Ship may well blurt out something that might be improper or that might be untrue. Well, counsel has to be very careful in the way one questions. But I, were I in your place, I would ask Mr. Ship, I would read to him the testimony that we've just discussed and ask him, isn't it a, a fact that between the discussion of DNA and between this alleged statement regarding a dream regarding killing his wife, there was a discussion of another topic in between. Isn't that correct? That's how I would ask that question. But I would also like to ask the question that when you testified yesterday that the dream, the alleged dream question or the statement was made in response to the DNA, that was not true. Your Honor, that's... All right. Ms. Clark? That's very unfair. Why? It was your question that led to that. But it was our question at the court's order. The no, court it ordered was that. My, your question. Here's the problem, uh, Ms. Clark. If you read the question, and what did he res say in response to your indication that it takes two months for DNA to come back? Wouldn't the more accurate way to do this would be to say? Was there a conversation about something else in between without telling us what that was? Answer, yes. Then was something else man mentioned? Answer, yes. What was that? But the way the question is phrased, it implies, and what the, in fact, it says, and what did he say in response to your indication that it takes DNA two months to come back? This was done, Your Honor, in an effort to comply with the court's order to excise the reference to the polygraph and to, I, I understand what the court is saying, perhaps. Do you agree it's done inartfully? I do. Okay. I do. I concede that, Your Honor. I do. No. Well, I conceded because it wasn't my question. No, I did. I'm just kidding. All right. I really, I agree with the court. All yeah. Right. That that was that. It could have been better done and should have, um, in had some indication in it. There was something in between. Mm -hmm. The problem that that I would like to point out to the court is that we're giving the impression that the witness was untruthful when all the witness was doing was attempting to follow the orders of the court and to respond to the question that was asked. And so to leave the jury with the impression that he was willfully uh, untruthful about something that he was confined by questioning to is, is unfair, and it's a misleading impression to give. Well, the problem I have, Ms. Clark, is that the impression was created by the way the question was phrased. Well, why, may, may I pose to the court another alternative, which would also protect counsel from anything being blurted out, is that perhaps the, court, the jury could be instructed uh, that there was conversation in between the DNA statement and the discussion of dreams. No, then the court is taking, then the court would be 
expressing an opinion as to what did or did not happen, which the court is not inclined to do in this. But how, this how would court. that? Well, Your Honor. Here's the problem. You've got an imprecise question. Cellophane is a no-no, counsel. All right. Um, you've got an imprecise question that created this inference. I think they're entitled to cross-examine on that. You can come back and clarify. But you're, you're punishing. I'm not, no, I'm not punishing anybody, Ms. Clark. I didn't ask the question. The code section clearly says we cannot discuss polygraph, period. If you want the statement in about the dreams, you have to tailor the testimony in your questioning to avoid that. It was done in an in, imprecise in, in way. It created an inference that's not true, at least based upon the statement that you have. So how can I instruct the jury that something, I mean, to instruct the jury as you request would be for me to assume that certain facts are true, which is not my job in this case. All I do is referee the disputes. This inference was created. They're entitled to cross-examine on it. And leave the impression that the witness was untruthful when, in fact, the witness was not at all. I mean, is, the, is that the well, cure? Ms. Clark, Ms. Clark, the problem wasn't created by the defense. They're going to take advantage of an imprecision in the way the question was asked. You can come back on direct examination and clean that up. The court was in essence saying that two wrongs make a right. I mean, I'm not saying that our question was not inartfully phrased because it was. But to come back and then create more misimpression, you know, through cross-examination that's misleading is, is not fair either. Well, the, what's we? true is for the jury to decide. Right, but they have to be given the facts in order to do that. And if we give them misimpressions and, and misrepresentations, they have no hope. determine what the facts are. Yes, but they have to get the truth in order to do that. They have to get the true state of affairs in order to make a fair judgment. And well, if that's we, what we're trying to find out is what the truth is, Ms. Clark. I agree, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> there's no question about that. All right. But it's a very difficult situation that you'll just have to handle on redirect. And I know Mr. Douglas is, is going to accept the court's uh, observations as to how to do this. May I ask then that counsel at least not be permitted to frame it in such a way as to make it sound as though the witness lied when he answered the question that, that was phrased in a manner that could be uh, construed because there, there was very little in between those two things, as the court mm -hmm. knows. I mean, it's not very far off. Uh, we know that, we, that the polygraph reference is taken out, but to allow counsel now to question the witness and essentially ask, isn't it true that you lied when you said it was in response to the DNA, uh, it was in response to the DNA answer, uh, is, un, is, is false, is completely false. But the problem is that the question is, quote, and what did he say in response to your indication that it takes DNA two months to come back? He kind of jokingly just said, you know, to be honest, ship, that's what he called me, ship. He said, I've had some dreams of killing her. Is that accurate? Why not? No. That... That's right. Your Honor, I, I can't admit it too many times. It, we, it could have been better, could have been more precise, and, and so I Douglas wish it had been. So Mr. Douglas is entitled to say, isn't, th isn't this statement incorrect? Wasn't there a, a conversation, in something, a subject discussed, and without telling us what that is, in between DNA and this discussion about dreams? Answer, yes. So when you said that this statement was made in response to the question about DNA, that was not a truthful answer, correct? That's correct. And that, but, that's not, but that's not correct. 
because the witness was not willfully false. The witness was responding to a question that attempted to address the issue before the court. It would be truthful to Ms. say Clark, I, under I understand your position very clearly, but the problem is the, the problem was created by the way the question was phrased. That's the problem. And why don't we cure it with the truth, Your Honor? Why not let the witness testify to the fact that he was ordered not well, to testify to, to certain things by the court? We're about to start this circle one more time. No, I mean, really, why not, why not tell the truth? The witness said, was ordered not to discuss certain things by the court, and those certain things came in between the reference to DNA and the reference to the dreams. All right, so you can bring that up during the course of your redirect. All right, thank you, counsel. Any other conundrums? Your Honor, we have frequently attempted to abide by the rule that when the court rules, the court rules and doesn't allow the other side to come back and whine or to try to change the court's ruling. I would hope that everyone would appreciate the spirit of that ruling. Thank you. <laughs> they just violated it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, counsel, let's let's stop that. I'm just an overly patient person, and I'm willing to listen to what most everybody has to say. All right. Anything else before we invite the jurors to join us? No, you're right. No, you're right. All right. Let's have the witnesses and the jurors, please. Let the record reflect that we have been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Mr. Ship, would you please resume the witness stand? All right. Good morning, Mr. Ship. You're reminded that you were still under oath. Mr. Douglas, do you wish to continue your cross examination? Thank you, Your Honor. I would. <coughs> Mr. Ship, when you testified yesterday, you mentioned that you would be bringing today the contract that you had had with Ms. Sheila Weller. Yes, sir. Why don't we have a uh, photocopy made, and uh, we'll agree that the <laughs> photocopy will be the uh, court's exhibit. And for the record, John, I've been given a one-page document. One thousand one, Your Honor. Yes. Okay. Mr. Ship, you were. Uh, Give that to Mrs. Robertson, so everybody can have a copy of it. Sure, Your Honor. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Mr. Ship. You were employed by the Los Angeles Police Department for about 15 years? Yes, I was. And one of the duties of a Los Angeles Police Department officer is to testify in courts, true? That's correct. In fact, before you were able to begin working as a patrol officer, you had to go through the police academy. Yes, I did and there were classes and training sessions educating the recruits about how to testify in court. This is true. 
over the 15 years that you've testified in the past as a police officer. Which, Oh, well. Over the 15 years that you've testified as a police officer, you've testified in jury trials and then you've testified in front of the courts without a jury. Yes, I have. And if you were to estimate the number of times that you've testified under oath, that number would be in the hundreds. Wouldn't you agree? Well, in 15 years, I've worked various assignments. I was not always in patrol. I worked um, some undercover. I worked um, juvenile division, so maybe out of the 15 years, I had approximately seven or eight years of actual patrol time, and the only time I ever testified or went to court was when I was working patrol. But wouldn't you agree that you've testified over 100 times in the past? Maybe not that much. Okay. What would be your estimate of the number of times you've testified in the past? Approximately. 50 to 60. So you would estimate that you would testify no more than four or five, I'm sorry, seven, eight or nine times per year for each of the seven or eight years that you were on patrol? If that much. Certainly you would agree that you were somewhat comfortable sitting in the witness stand from your past experience. It depends sometimes I was. I mean, if I was in traffic court, I don't know why I used to write lousy tickets, so sometimes I get a little nervous. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Ship, when we left off yesterday, we were talking about your alcohol problem. Do you recall that? Yes. And you said that you no longer have an alcohol problem, didn't you? That's correct. Now, your alcohol problem started when? When I was a police officer. <laughs> about what year did the problem start? I'd say it probably kind of got out of hand, I think, around maybe 83. And you believe that your alcohol problem ended when? Um, probably when I left the police department. Which would have been 89. 89. Now, as a result of your alcohol problem, you were suspended for 30 days as a police officer, weren't you? Yeah. No, I was not. Yes, with the court report, please. All right, thank you, counsel. Uh, Mr. Red Douglas, you may resume. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I have that last question re-read, please? Now, as a result of your alcohol problem, you were suspended. You had a suspension for 30 days as a police officer. Your Honor, made it right back now. I'm withdrawing my objection to that question. Noted. And your answer to that question is, sir? No. You were suspended for 30 days while you worked at the academy, were you not? No, I was not. Wasn't there occasion, sir, when you came to the academy with alcohol in your breath? Yes, there was. Didn't you receive a discipline as a result of that conduct? Yes, I did. What was that discipline? I received 15-day suspension. What year was that? 
1988, I believe. What happens to you, sir, when you get intoxicated? Objection, irrelevant. You know. Sustained. When you are under the influence of alcohol, does it tend to affect your ability to recall? Same objection. Sustained. On June 13th, 1994, you were drinking at Mr. Simpson's house. No, I was you? not. Do you recall, sir, an occasion when you were seated, withdrawn? Inside Mr. Simpson's home, there's a bar area, isn't there? That is correct. And the bar area is an area where the TV council was also set up. That's true? correct. And when you were present on June 13th, there were other members, as we said, of Mr. Simpson's family that were there as well. True? That's correct. Mr. Simpson's sisters were there. Right. There were individuals such as Joe Stellini that was there. Right. Uh, there was a person by the name of Peter Bort that was there. Oh, yes, Peter was there. That's right. And you were Bort. B O R T, I believe, Your Honor. Right. And there was an occasion when you were seated at the bar area with Mr. Simpson's sister, Carmelita. Do you remember that? Um, on this particular night? Yes. The 13th? Correct. No, I was not. And do you remember, sir, that while you were seated near the bar with Mr. Simpson's sister, she asked if you wanted a drink? We just asked. Not in evidence, but he was at the Sustained. Let me try to refresh your recollection. Do you recall a conversation where she asked you if you wanted a drink and you said, no, but I'll have a beer? Objection, Your Honor. The question is vague as to time. Overruled. You may answer. I recall a conversation, but not on the 13th. Okay. When do you recall that conversation having occurred? It, either the 14th or the 15th. I had no drinks whatsoever on the 13th, none. While Mr. Simpson was in the home as well? Pardon me? This conversation that you had with Carmelita was while Mr. Simpson was also at his home, correct? No, he was not. He left Tuesday morning. Because Mr. Simpson wasn't home Tuesday morning, true? He left Tuesday morning. And when you were there during the rest of the week, what service were you rendering? Assistance to the family. Were you acting as, as like security? No, not at okay. all. So it's your recollection that this conversation that you had with Carmelia and you took a beer was not on the 13th? It was not on the 13th. And what day do you recall that it was? I was either the 14th or the 15th. Okay. I was there every day that week. Now, when you are under the influence of alcohol, do you have occasion to visit people unannounced? Yeah, I have. Okay. And you have, while under the influence of alcohol, visited people unannounced even last year. True? Last year? Correct. Uh, you have to refresh my memory on that one. Let me try to do that. Before he does that, John, that's irrelevant. Sustain. Well, actually, let me, no, overruled. He's testified to uh, the length and breadth of alcohol abuse. When you say, Mr. Ship, that you didn't have a drug problem, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an alcohol problem after 1989, are you saying by that that you have not been drunk since 1989? No, I'm saying. Uh, to me, a drinking problem, and let me ex explain this, you know, when I did have a drinking problem, I was the one that told myself, according to all my friends and family, they were, everybody was shocked. It was me. It was my standards. I respect that, but my question is, you still have gotten drunk since 89, haven't you? I'd say yes. In fact, July of 1994, you got drunk, and 1 o'clock in the morning, you started banging on the door of Kathy Randa, disturbing her neighbors, didn't you? Your Honor, that's irrelevant. Beyond the days of the murders, beyond the conversation you had with the Sustain. May I put you on to, to, to link it up? So way past the dates here. Your Honor, it's part of a continuing pattern, I suggest. Briefly. Very well.
You do recall that incident, do you not? Oh, yes, I do. It was 1 o'clock in the morning? Um, yeah, roughly around there. You created a disturbance? No, I did not. Neighbors had to come out to restrain you? The neighbors were already out when I got there. Isn't it true, Mr. Ship, that as a result of your banging on Miss Randa's doors, her neighbors came out out of concern? No, they were already. Kathy had told me they had been watching out for her for the whole week because all the different news people were trying to hang out and bother her. Now, when you were drunk in July of 1994, was that a result of the turmoil that you talked about yesterday? Just about everybody that came to that house was drunk during the time. And you were drunk again on another occasion when you came by Miss Randa's home. Isn't that true? In August of 94? Yeah. August of 94. Let's approach, let's approach the sidebar. I think we've...